Carlos Nelson with Cascade Media Group. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Black History. It's Black History Month. And we have our esteemed guest, Ms. Sharon Sanders Brooks, uh, with Basic Black Historical Consultant Services. And I've known Sharon for, I think, about 20 years. And uh, she does a whole lot of work. Uh, not just in the history department for the black community. As far as I'm concerned, she's one of the uh, sisters in our soul sister, I would say, that uh, uh, is concerned about the well-being of our community. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you very much, Carlos, for inviting me. Glad to be a part. Tell our audience a little bit about what you're going to talk about uh, in today's show. Today, I would like to share um, information about um, several African-American women in the legal profession and those who have had a profound impact on the legal system. Of course, we are eagerly awaiting uh, President Biden has promised and is committed to appointing an African-American woman to the U.S. Supreme Court. This would be historic, the first African-American woman to do to be on the Supreme Court, which is well overdue. But the road to the U.S. Supreme Court began many, many years ago. And sadly, because our history in the U.S. has not been encompassing or inclusive of all of the citizens of the U.S., many of us in school, whether it was elementary, middle school, high school, and even college courses, the contributions of African-American women to the development of our country have been very limited. We learned, some of us learned about Harriet Tubman and later on there was Shirley Chisholm. And that was pretty much it in terms of African-American women being discussed in history. However, in 1797, Lucy Terrace Prince, Terry Prince, argued her own case before the U.S. Supreme Court. And believe it or not, she won this case. And the American Bar, according to the American Bar Association Journal, she, Lucy Terry Prince, was the first African-American woman to argue a case before the U.S. Supreme Court. Many think um, that the first African-American woman to argue before the Supreme Court didn't occur to into the 1960s when Justice Constance Baker, Judge Constance Baker Motley argued a case, but more about Judge Motley later. And um, you think about it, the Supreme Court was very new at the time, but she was successful in arguing her case among uh, against certified attorneys. She was not an attorney, but she argued her case and beat the attorneys from that were representing the state in that case. Secondly, we have um, Ludie Lyle. She was the first African-American woman to teach law in a chartered law school in the U.S. She joined the law school faculty in 1897 and it was the faculty of Central Tennessee Law School in Nashville, Tennessee. She was also admitted to the Kansas Bar that has a local connection here in the Midwest. She was the first African-American woman to be admitted to, as a lawyer in the state of Kansas. She was admitted to practice law in both Kansas and Tennessee, both. She died in 1950. Um, then we have our own in Kansas City, Leona Pouncey Thurman. She was the first African-American woman in Kansas City to practice law. She was a graduate of Howard University Law School. She graduated in 1949, returned to Kansas City and opened her law practice. Her practice was located at the historic in the historic 18th and Vine District. And sadly, the building where our office was housed was just torn down several years ago in Kansas City. She practiced um, criminal cases as well as divorce cases. And she was a very, um, very prominent and a successful attorney. 
She was one in, uh, she opened her practice in 1949. And to just highlight how few African-American women attorneys we had in the state of Missouri in 1950, there were only five African-American women lawyers in the entire state of Missouri. That's how rare it was to have an African-American woman attorney. And we were fortunate to have Miss Pouncey Thurman. I knew her. She was all, and you know, she was instrumental in starting preservation efforts for 18th and Vine. I think Larry Coleman was in there with her at the end. Okay. Okay. Uh, that that building uh, turned into the Black Chamber, I think, uh, that she was in. That it they, was next door. It was next door was next to the door Black to Chamber. Uh-huh. It right. was next door to the Black Chamber building. When we look at the overview of African-American women as we march toward, hopefully, um, the U.S. Supreme Court appointment of African-American woman, and I will go back to that because I don't want people to think that's a done deal. Congressman Cleaver stated last week um, that if the vote was taken, had been taken last week, she would, uh, African American woman would not have been appointed because the votes in the US Senate are that tight. And at that time, I guess based upon, you know, how you do the behind the scenes count, they did not have the uh, enough votes to secure an appointment at that time. So I don't want people to get comfortable and say, yes, it's done. No, it's work that we have to do and lobby our U.S. senators for the appointment of an African-American woman. And I'll come back to that point later. Let me flip back. In terms of the march toward um, the U.S. Supreme Court, the first African-American woman attorney in the U.S. was um, Charlotte E. Ray. She too was a graduate of Howard University Law School and she graduated in 1872. And why that is so historically important, not only was she the first, but we have to remember that was just seven years after the end of the US Civil War. At the time, although women were not allowed to be members of the District of Columbia Bar, she took the bar exam and she applied under the initial C.E. Ray, so they did not know she was a woman. And she was she didn't disclose that she was a woman. She used her initials. And she thus became the first, Afri first woman member of the District of Columbia Bar, Charlotte E. Ray, 1872. Then we have, in terms of judgeships, in 1939, we have Judge Jane Matilda Bolden. She was the first black woman graduate of Yale Law School. And she was the first black woman to, um, to join the New York City Bar. And as I stated, she was the first African-American woman judge when she was appointed a judge in 1939 to the New York City Domestic Relations Court. And on a federal level, the first African-American woman federal judge was the Honorable Judge Constance Baker Motley. She was a key strategist in the, U in the U.S. civil rights movement in terms of legal cases. She was a prominent attorney. She joined the, Le New the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. And she was hired there by Judge, at the, excuse me, he was Attorney Thurgood Marshall at the time before joining the bench. She argued nine cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. She won, no, she argued 10 cases, excuse me, before the U.S. Supreme Court, winning nine. And Judge Motley before, as I stated, as a civil rights attorney, she was instrumental in working on 60 cases that came before the US Supreme Court. The first African, as the first, she was also the first African-American woman lawyer 
to argue before the Supreme Court. That was 1962. Now I share with you back in the 1800s when the first woman, black woman argued the case, but Motley was the first African-American lawyer, black woman lawyer to argue the case. And that case was part of the James Meredith case. And that was called Meredith versus Fair. She was involved in the James Meredith, helping him integrate the College University of Mississippi. But, uh, so she had a prominent, very prominent career and very successful. She was also a political, political person. She served as a New York State Senator and she was the borough president in Man of Manhattan in New York City. All these things she did before becoming um, appointed to the judge judgeship in New York City. So we see that the role of African-American women in law, the road has been long, it's been hard fought, and there are other women who could have been on the US Supreme Court there. This is my opinion um, in terms of skill, ability, and talent but they were not afforded the opportunity and some were before their times. I, two that I would like to say that I believe would have made um, excellent Supreme Court justices. One was Judge, Judge Constance Baker Motley and the other was Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. If you read in her biography and there was a play here in Kansas City about um, Congresswoman Barbara Jordan, she ex um, wanted to be on the US Supreme Court. But due to, I say, pettiness and jealousy and sexism by members of the Congressional Black Caucus, if you read her book, you will see that there was, because she did not adhere to the policy that they had of all sitting together, all the members of the CBC sat together in Congress at that time, Congresswoman Barbara Jordan did not. She sat, and if you ever visit the, um, the chamber, you will see, she sat in an area where she could be directly in the eyesight of the speaker. The members of the CBC at the time, I, and when I was there in, two, in the 2000s, they were still sitting in the same, they sat to the side, but she wanted to be in a straight shot. So there was some resentment because they felt that she was not adhering to the um, body, the CBC body. So they, um, you, know, you know, in order to be appointed to the Supreme Court, you have to have political power and support. So there were those that spoke against her. And then sadly, somehow her medical condition, which she had only shared with very few people, that was the early stages, had been leaked and it made it into the media. So of course, being the, for the president to appoint someone, they're gonna be concerned about their health and conditions. But I think um, Congresswoman Barbara Jordan would have made an excellent Supreme Court justice. And I encourage anyone, if you have never seen Congresswoman Barbara Jordan in action, especially watch the clip, the opening of the Watergate hearings. I'm, I'm to cut off, King. Uh, Two things. My classmate, uh, Joyce uh, Beatty, is uh, the chair of Congressional Black Caucus out of Central State University. Mm -hmm. And uh, for audience, go to Cascade, uh, What's Up Kansas City. We did a special on Barbara Jordan uh, for Black History Month. It's about a five or six minute piece uh, on Barbara. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Back to you, Sarah. All right. And Carlos, if you could, if you could upload that um, opening um, comments by Congresswoman Barbara Jordan at the start of the Watergate hearing, that is one of the most profound judicial arguments and public speaking that I think I've ever heard. We the people where she helped save democracy from a president that sought to thwart democracy and the US Constitution. And lastly, as we head into um, the, the end of this presentation, I would like to share several books that I think would be helpful um, in terms of those who are interested in reading more about African-American women in the law. We'll, uh, we'll show them as you talk about them. Okay. As you talk about the books, I'll flash. Uh, okay. The first is Rebels in Law, Voices in History, 
in the history of black women lawyers, edited by J. Clay Smith. She took justice, the black woman, the law and power, 1619 to 1969 by Gloria J. Brown Marshall and equal justice under the law written by Judge Constance Baker Motley herself. There is also a new biography of Judge Motley, but Equal Justice Under the Law is the book that Judge Motley wrote herself in 1998. Um, so those are, th uh, those are three books that I think would be very helpful in having a clearer understanding of um, the role of African-American women in the legal profession. Also, I highly recommend Barbara Jordan's, her own biography, where she talks about um, the role of sexism in politics, the role of how she even be ever, ever became a, an elected official. When we hear the term redistricting, some don't understand, but she had to fight a legal case because of the redistricting the segregation and the, the total um, discrimination that she encountered trying to run for office and even joining the Texas Democratic Party. So her book, people don't understand, state political parties um, were considered a private entity and it took a legal case for black people to even be able to join the state party, let alone run for, for election in these parties. But they just, so they had to file action, legal action against the state of Texas to even be able to join the Democratic Party. And due to gerrymandering, another term, that's where they rigged the districts they had gerrymandered Houston so that it was very difficult for an African-American to win. So finally, after a legal case, that's how Barbara Jordan was able to win her state Senate seat and then go on later to um, go into Congress and to be the first African-American woman elected from the South in the US Congress. I'm gonna give a shameless <laughs> plug. Also, we did a special on Shirley Chisholm. Yes. So uh, take a look at that uh, audience. Yes. In closing, what uh, closing words would you have for our audience? Um, the in closing, I would like to say it it will take the wor uh, work of all of us to have um, an African American woman on the U.S. Supreme Court. I talked about earlier, I mentioned that lobbying and we all have the ability with the technology we have to send a brief text message email or pick up the phone and call your U.S. Senator. In the state of Missouri, we have Josh Hawley and Roy Blunt. They will vote. And you know that the margin in the U.S. Senate is slim. Uh, if you have, uh, and the it requires a majority uh, to vote, uh, to to appoint and the tiebreaker vote. If they have all the Democrats on board to support a candidate, then the tiebreaker to take her over the threshold would be the vice president, Pamela Harris. So you see it's critically important that we have as many votes as possible. Um, the initially there were eight that the media counted, um, touted as being potential um, women do you have the names in front of you by any chance? I have s some of the names. Because uh, we're not, I'm okay. not familiar. I'm familiar with maybe two leading candidates that I've gotten off of the major news networks. If you okay. have, you, you know, okay. I don't think our community knows. Okay. Uh, the names that I have initially were Leandra Kruger. She's on the California Supreme Court. J. Michelle Childs. Um, out of South Carolina, that is the candidate that you've heard um, that Congressman um, Congressman Clyburn is supporting out of South Carolina, as well as U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham is supporting um, her. Graham is supporting her? Oh, yes. That's great. Yes, yes. The Congressional Black Caucus is not endorsing any candidate for the U.S. Supreme Court per Congressman Cleaver, because they know all the women whose names have been submitted for the shortlist are eminently qualified. Let me repeat that again, eminently qualified. 
Isn't it interesting that when other people are set up for nominations, it's never, see, affirmative action hire. It's a woman's quota. You know good and well any woman's name that will be submitted for the U.S. Supreme Court is going to be uh, eminently qualified. And by the way, the, the Constitution does not require that you be an attorney but all of them are attorneys and judges. But just for the record, want to let you know, it does not state you have to be a lawyer in order to be a U.S. Supreme Court judge. Okay, another um, candidate, uh, not candidate, I don't want to say that, but the, who's been listed, Wilhelmina Mimi Wright. She's on the Minnesota Supreme Court. Judge Eunice Lee, um, Candace Jackson uh, Akumi, She's a circuit judge. And let's see. Those are, okay. Did, did I mention Judge Eunice Lee? Those are some yeah. of the names. Those are yeah, that's excellent. Kajanji Brown. Kajanji Brown Jackson also. So those are some, those are some of the names. If you Google, um, you can Google African American um, US Supreme Court potential nominees and the list will come up. Many of these women have been vetted prior to this because the effort to appoint an African-American woman to the Supreme Court, this is not a new endeavor. The late um, C. Dolores Tucker and the National Political Congress of Black Women were lobbying for an African-American woman to be appointed during the Clinton administration. And then, of course, to do President Obama's administration, we certainly thought we would have gotten an African-American woman judge when he had the opportunity to appoint three U.S. Supreme Court judges. But unfortunately, once again, the Black woman is the last of the last of the last. Well, we're going to put uh, the ones that were uh, last in line, we're putting them in first in line. I believe that... Uh, We'll get a, a woman Supreme Court judge, don't know who, but I think our community as a whole uh, deserves it. It's long time uh, overdue. And um, I'm looking forward uh, on the national side. I don't believe in the Republicans or the Democrats, but I do think that uh, Biden is trying to right the ship a little bit on the on social issues and other issues that are affecting people that uh, are of color and that have been disenfranchised uh, since we got here. And I think there are more people uh, in the majority community that are coming to grips uh, with this and really uh, are seeing that uh, We've got to have this diversity. Our country is at stake and we're living in critical times right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we always say in closing, when you invest in your community, you're really just investing in yourself. Good night. This is brought to you by the Black Archives of Mid-America.